Do you want to bust your sales quota? Do you want to join the ranks of top 1% high-tech sellers? The Top 1% Sellers Factory podcast gives you the insights and the tools to help you achieve your sales greatness. The podcast features sales and services professionals, leaders, and experts to give you the edge you're looking for. Here's your host, Ash Sadiq. I am today with Tim Sanders, a New York Times best-selling author. He is the well-known author for Love is the Killer App, and we are here today because of his new book um, that is a fantastic book called Deep Storming, and we will be taking a look at this book today and really delve deeper into, into it because I know Tim has spoken a few times um, already um, with with other uh, for other interviews, but we want to try as much as possible to cover some uh, other aspects uh, and really make sure this is very useful for our audience. We're really talking to a lot of sales professionals in in high tech and other industries as well. And what I'd love to do is sort of give them a sense of you know what deal storming is and how to actually make sure they can implement it in the right way. So let's get started by taking a look at what was the catalyst for uh, putting this together in a book? Well, um, about, I would say, 18 years ago, I had a specific selling situation when I was working for Mark Cuban at his tech startup, Broadcast.com. I was on the enterprise business services team. They had just brought in a new VP from a router company called Ascend. A lot of you know about Ascend. Um, his name was Stan Woodward. He'd worked on a lot of very large, complex deals. We were at a point, Ash, where getting ready for our IPO, we needed to prove to the market that we could actually do a large enterprise deal. Up until then, we were doing really low ACV deals, you know, a couple of thousand here and there, hosting video, a small webcast for a university, et cetera, but nothing really big. So Stan came in to change all that. And what he noticed is that the reason we didn't do big deals wasn't because we were unknown as a startup. Actually, we were a leader in the streaming media space. We didn't do them because they got yeah. stuck. And when they got stuck, we wasted a lot of time on them and the small ACVs were coming in quickly. So he knew this is no way to build a great business. So there's a meeting he has with us where he talks to us about the idea that when you get stuck, Go grab somebody who knows something about your problem or who really cares about whether you win or how you win. He said, whatever yeah. you do, don't keep it in sales. Don't escalate it to Cuban, which I'll talk about later why escalation is not the same thing as collaboration. He's like, build a team, make it rain. And I remember at the time I thought about brainstorming and deal making kind of coming together as a process. That's the first time I said to a buddy, hey, we're going to start yeah. brainstorming. And we started it. We landed a bunch of big deals. It was really important because six months later, we had the largest opening day in IPO history, fueled in part by the market's belief that we really could do enterprise sales with video and audio streaming. When I got to Yahoo after the acquisition, the dot com yeah. crash had happened. So it's like March 2000, yeah. dot com crash. We have to backfill all of our revenue that we used to get from startups and dot coms with Fortune 5,000 companies, you know, like Microsoft and Nike and Procter and & Gamble. And all the big things. Yeah. And, and those were all big, complicated deals because we had to take out incumbents like Time Warner, AOL for digital, or say Tribune, et cetera, for their existing advertising. So this deal storming thing became what we had to do across all of the verticals in sales. To give you an idea, as a facilitator, I traveled three yeah. 100 days, 300 days in 2002 wow. on these, these collaboration sessions. But anyway, um, we did two and a half billion dollars of deal flow within two and a half years, really good pace. We built the business. Even though Yahoo goes sideways, the reason it even exists today, unlike Lycos or, or Excite or those guys, is that we were quick at problem solving at the deal level. After I left Yahoo for the next decade, I consulted to a lot of companies, many software companies, hardware companies, a real specialty in marketing solutions. Over 100 deal storms, Ash, here's what we've learned. You'll yes. triple your closing ratio for complex deals. If you build the right wide team, you run meetings with the correct cadence, and you focus on rapid problem solving and whatever you do, don't shy away from the complex deals because your competitors are. 
Yes, that, that's fascinating to me. And I'd love for you to, as you look at big high tech companies, not every deal is like any other deal, right? right. You cannot really think of them as, as the same type. And I have seen companies, you know, think of, of course, you know, got your strategic accounts, you've got perhaps client director accounts, transformational accounts. How do you then, you know, pick the ones to focus on versus others, right? Because you cannot really do all of them. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a really good question. And, and, and I'm not going to do slides, but I'm going to do one thing for you here. I'm going to show you the process, right? Because I'm yes. a process guy. I start out in the yeah. quality movement. I'm a process person. So when I think about sales, I think about how do we put a process around how we sold that deal? Why? So we could do it again. So it's not yeah. just one-offs, right? Why? So we can deliver on it. I was thinking about that this morning. You know, there's nothing worse than a deal you can't deliver on and quite frequently. So there's a process involved. So let me just share. I'm going to share it very quickly sure. with you that what this process looks like. And this is something that we developed, again, over like an 18-year period. So you'll see here that deal storming yeah. is a process and it harnesses innovative thinking and process thinking together to create the next play. Because every big deal is a hundred problems solved with individual plays. That's why people get scared of those deals. But if you have this yeah. process in place, you move through it. So look at the top, qualify. So to answer your question directly, what we figured out by about that 60th deal storm with, with consulting clients is that yeah. there's a high cost to collaboration for everybody. For the enterprise, you know, for non-sales people, you're bringing in, say, from marketing or operations or delivery or technology or whatever, security. Those people have to come off of their job against those key KPIs and work on your job, right? So there's a cost yeah. to that. So you got to figure this out. There's also a cost to the, the account executive, right? Because when the account executive goes outside of sales to build this SWAT team, if you will, there is... Yeah control that's lost, right? It could take longer. It could be Absolutely. sort of a consensus situation. So anyway, to qualify collaboration, you ask yourself two formulaic questions. Number one, how big is the opportunity if we win or if we lose, right? Because yeah. it could be a new, new piece of business. It could be a renewal crisis. It could be getting fired. I worked on a lot of those deals before. So yeah. how big is that deal in a scale of one to 10? And ask yourself, Ash, what I mean by big is strategic to the business. Could be revenue, yeah. could be market penetration. If it's an account saver or renewal, it could be barriers to entry or even reputation. But calculated strategic value in collaboration with your sales manager or your sales leaders, give it a score to one to 10, okay? Absolutely, Second, yeah. You could be also trying to display the competitor as well. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. It, could be, it could be a market issue, right? So you figure out how big it is, score at 1 to 10, 10 being high. Now, the second piece of the puzzle is to ask yourself, how hard is this sales situation? How hard is this challenge? It could be yeah. a single sticking point that is so bad, like they think we lied to them and it's gone all the way to their CEO. That's bad. It's a single sticking point, but it's highly complicated. Or it can just be like this labyrinth account. You can't get in. Once you get in, you can't get information to figure out the deal. Once you figure out the deal, you can't get access to 30 decision makers. Once you get there, their legal department's a nightmare. That's a multiple stick. But anyway, however you look at it, yeah. give that a score from 1 to 10 called the degree of difficulty, okay? So now you got two scores. In the book, I talk about this, this chart. We created this flow-through chart, and I'll send it to you to post um, to your followers. But basically yeah. – a nine over nine equal 81. 81 would fall into the zone of what we call an ultra wide team. That's going to be a minimum of four perspectives. It's going to have some budget for travel and research. You're going to resource against the opportunity. But let's say it's like a six over four. Oh, that's what most of your yeah. pipeline deals are, really six over four that you're actually worrying about and looking at. Um, that's only, you know, it's a smaller score. Now that's only a 24. You're going to have a small. Exactly. You're probably only going to have three perspectives. Um, you're probably not going to have budget for travel. So if they're not in office, they're going to have to use some kind of resource like this. You're going to resource against the value. And as you kind of move through this process that I'm screen sharing right now, um, you're going to keep thinking about it, analyzing whether you still need to have a team, reporting back to everyone, including senior management, whether we kill this project or whether we expand the team. But the secret sauce here is you resource yeah. against the opportunity. And then the next time there's a 
a deal storm that looks like yours, I think it's important to collaborate with that account executive, figure out what could have saved more time because again, it's all about speed to solution, rapid problem solving, mm -hmm. the best sales organizations figure out. Yeah, no, that, that's terrific. And, and, and reflecting back on some of the high tech companies where I work, a lot of the account managers are mavericks. Of they course. don't necessarily want to stick to the process and they don't want to raise their hand and say I have a problem with the account. Yeah. How would you just advise the sales manager who has a number of account managers working for him or her and maybe there is a deal that's stuck and is not knowing that that's the case. How do you sort of make sure that that sales manager has enough intelligence to go down and take a look at that funnel and uncover those? Yeah, well, let's t tackle both problems, right? So first of all, let's talk about culture. Um, yeah. In my experience, when I go into big accounts, it could be a big software company, it could be a huge technology outsource company, a defense contractor, I see this all the time. So you got that lone wolf. He's really good at what yeah. he does. When he thinks of collaboration, he's trying to get a couple of sign-offs and he's pushing the account coordinator. Maybe he's asking an engineer to call and explain it to the prospect. That's what he thinks it's all about. And he's not right. going to raise his hand and say, I'm stuck. I need to build a team. He's also not going to relinquish control. That's the main thing. It's like he's going to run the show. And this deal strumming thing feels like sharing. Um, what we've learned about that guy is you cannot incentivize or rehabilitate the lone wolf. You just can't. Yeah. Um, here's what you can do, though. You can inspire the lone wolf by watching someone they know they're better than kick their butts through collaboration. Yeah. That's what we learn. We go in with sales leaders and we'd say, let's use the formula I just described. Let's go find 10 deal stormy candidates. And then I'd look yeah. at the 10 deal stormy candidates. And since we're trying to do it for the first time in a culture, I ask myself, what's the easiest one to build a four or more perspective team with, right? Four or more perspectives could be sales, marketing, legal, finance. That's four. Four yeah. different ways of seeing the world. I'll talk to you about this in a minute, why that's important. But we go yeah. find one where we can easily build a team. And I audit it. I don't run it. The AE runs the show. She's the problem. Yeah. So I'm sitting in the back of the room coaching them. Anyway, when they win that deal, and we always pick a mid-level performing rep to run that show. When they win that deal, and it's a big deal, things change. Yeah. All of a sudden, we go from crickets to multiple requests for deal storms. So remember this, culture is a conversation led by leaders and punctuated yeah. wins and losses. And it's a conversation about how we do things here successfully. Exactly. That's really exactly. Important. So find the one where you can build a wide team and win and impress your lone wolves with the come from behind victory and you'll change things. Here's the second thing to talk about. The research suggests that when you have the habit of collaborating across departments, you're going to triple your close ratio on the larger deals where there's a yeah. good product prospect fit. You're going to compress the sales cycle by 25% and you're going to double the quality of delivery later. All of oh, the on, yeah, 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 which is uh, how, how it should they consume, uh, consume that technology that they purchase. Right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I understand that when, when, you're, when you're thinking about um, what you just got for the sales manager, um, when you have done this in your consulting engagements, how do you go in? What does that engagement look like? I want to give some of the audience, especially, again, people who are in sales leadership roles, what that engagement will look like in order to really establish that process, to your point. If the culture is not there yet, how do you make sure it does, it does happen? Well, I mean, the, the, the cult, it's like the challenger sale, right? You've got to get that culture in place. And you get the culture in place by a sales leader saying, we are going to change the way we deal with complex deals and complex renewals. And that sales yeah. leader is going to partner with another team player in the organization. They're going to find that opportunity. Um, they're going to win. And they're going to report upwards. Um, what you asked me earlier why I wrote the book. I wrote the book for the purpose of actually train the trainer. I wanted to figure yeah. out a way to, to write a book and create a video boot camp. It's like two hours long, which we'll talk about later, where 
Yeah. They never have to hire a consultant to do this. The process is too refined to have to have somebody come in and handhold you on it. If you've ever yeah. figured out how to build a team at work, you can build a deal storm. The other thing too is that there have been CEOs um, since the book came out. They kind of reached out and said, you know, I, my, my guys don't do this. Sales and marketing, they just throw stuff at each other. How do I fix it? And the answer yeah. is, the next time an escalation opportunity comes to you, respond with deal storming and push it down. So when your VP of sales says, Ash, we're stuck on a $4 million deal. Come on in, CEO. We need you to escalate, which really means two things. You either pick up the phone and call the other CEO or you approve an exception to customization or resources. That's a bad idea every single time. Yeah. Instead of doing those things, CEO, I say, why don't you say, Go look at this process, watch the 20 minute teaser, let's build the deal storm, follow A, B, C, and D, and let's use that this time and let that be the focus of CEO escalation. Multiple times, they came back and said, yeah. you've got a storm going, we're in stage two, and you could see that it changes the psychology of an organization. It allows the CEO to lead people to problem solve. Here's the last thing. I interviewed more than 200 sales leaders, of which represent every high-tech company there is, every single one. Almost all yeah. of them, SAP Cloud, um, Oracle, et cetera, they have something in place for larger deals. What they don't have something in place for are the medium-sized deals, right? So a lot of them have yeah. this large account team that goes out, and they're usually you know, really good at doing client research, they're really good at presentation elements, they're really good sometimes at negotiation. Um, what I love to do is involve those folks and turn them into trainers for the enterprise to work on all the medium deals, those six over fours that get stuck, because that's where deal storming really becomes like an app that sits on top of your existing sales process and can really accelerate sales performance, if nothing else by creating momentum in an organization through a bunch of wins they thought they couldn't get. Absolutely. It helps you grow these middle of, middle of the pie accounts into bigger ones mm -hmm. as, as you work on these deep storms. Right. Because think of complexity as a barrier to entry for sales. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So, so companies don't create complexity on purpose. You know, the reason that complexity yeah. exists now really is that buyers are becoming more organized, so they think but they're at the same time becoming more dysfunctional and overwhelmed. So yes. my buddies over at Corporate Executive Board would tell you that buyer overwhelm is like the biggest issue inside enterprise accounts, and it results in a no decision, right? So the buyer, exactly. the, the status quo, thing. they muddle along, they got so much information, they're overwhelmed. It's like revolving chairs on who's involved in the project, but the sign-offs are out on the perimeter and they're not changing. And at the end of the day, the problem owner on the buyer side just says, we're going to just stick with what we're doing. I mean, when I talk to my consulting clients every single time in pipeline, that's three quarters of the pipeline. And we say, well, why yep. is that? Well, they, they, they don't get it. Well, that is not a way to run a world-class organization. The answer is the complexity has erupted from their haphazard attempts to team up on us. So let's solve yeah. that with sales innovation. And that's where either process management or deal storming comes into place. Absolutely. How do you see it? I mean, talking about SAP Cloud and basically sort of that transformation into cloud, how do you see changing how people are selling and where perhaps maybe deal storm can really make things easier for them, especially so, where, you have, where they have to engage services a whole lot more? Yeah, yeah, because it does change things, right? Because you're getting, into, you're getting into more stakeholders when you do that, right? So you're yeah. now taking a look in cloud situations and information security. You've got technology. You've got the end user who uh, the technology is so elegant now, the end user is an expert, which they used to not be an expert. They just used to be an end yeah. user. You have third-party procurement. Consultants now are adding this to their repertoire. We're going to manage your buy cycle, manage your technology, et cetera. So you're getting a lot of people that are coming in on the decision. You know, the big issue, Ash, is that you won't get a chance to spend any time with most of them, right? So if you look at yeah. CPD's 5.4 problem they talk about, um, I have to update this. IDC research says that's going up 20% year over year. So the 5.4 problem of 2012 is a 7.2 problem today. I'm kind of making this up. Do you get the point? It's yeah. a rising number. Sure that you have to win to, to beat the status quo. The problem is the tipping point has happened a long time ago where basically we don't get in front of half 
half of who we yeah. have to be doing. What does that mean? We've got to do a better job at doing one of two things developing self-forward devices, whatever those are. Those are infographics. Those are visualizations of cost of ownership or upside. Those are really customized metaphors that resonate inside the buying organization where everybody can kind of relate to what this looks like in the past. Um, it's something that can sell when you're not around. I've seen that really make a difference. And believe me, that's when the collaboration between sales and marketing and engineering and other disciplines can really come together and do something special. But here's the second issue that's bigger, is that yeah. we've got to do a good job of finding champions inside existing accounts and turning them into mobilizers who can really focus on solving the overwhelm, trimming the tree of decision makers, and really pushing everybody to make some kind of decision, even if it's no, but you've got to really creatively engage that mobilizer. I'm not talking about social selling either. You have to connect with the mobilizer's agenda, their psychological curriculum for their company that makes them the yeah. leader, the teacher, et cetera. And that's a creative challenge for sales. It's not something you're going to pull off the sales enablement shelf at most companies. Um, so that's exactly. a, a point of collaboration, not only between sales and enablement, but with other parts of the company too. I've seen situations, yeah. Ash, where this mobilizer thing was tackled in combination with sales training, where sales training kind of came to the table and says, well, if I was onboarding somebody but only had you know, six hours to onboard them on our working at this company, which would be using your process, this is how we yeah. accelerate onboarding. And all of a sudden, sales is like, oh, we need to think differently about how we arm the mobilizer, the inside champion, to sell on our behalf. So that's a great example of unlikely collaboration in a deal storming situation. Uh, absolutely. And I'd love for you, I, I, when I was reading the book, I love the piece about the personas within the deal storming effort itself. Could you describe to, to the people sort of those different hats that people would wear and what kind of uh, impact you see happening um, if you didn't use uh, that technique? So think about it this way. Perspective is worth 50 IQ points. Alan Kay, really big, you know, in, in pioneer in technology, IQ. Why is perspective worth so much? Because when yeah. you see a problem from a point of view, a persona, if you will, you see it with a certain strategy. And when you see it with a certain strategy, you make associations even quicker, which again gets back to speed of finding the next best play. So there's three yeah. As I've seen that you put on when you're working through the four levels of the sale. So, you know, just to make this kind of easy peasy, let me pull something up here to really make this point. So, sure. in each selling situation, uh, we move through four very distinct levels of the sale. And in each one of those levels of the sale, we likely get stuck. So the first level of sales to make contact, right? The second level yeah. of sales is what I call the conceive level. That's where we're putting together the elements of the deal that we can project high ROI, high cost of ownership. Yeah. The third level, what the the, right. And then the third one is convince. This is where we have to convince them that they need to make a change. We got to convince them we're the best ones and that this deal's yeah. right. And then the final one is we have to contract, okay? So think about those as the four levels we move through. In each level, a different persona may be required to solve the situation at hand. So for example, if you're stuck at the contact level, you can't get in the front door, you need to assume the hacker persona. Yeah. Right? I the see. hacker takes yeah. an unexpected but elegant approach to a situation. They're one click ahead of the target. And you know, that's what makes them succeed. I mentioned social selling, classic example of a hack. That's what it yeah. is. Use LinkedIn and yeah. care about people engaging with their content as a hack to create a warm call. Um, so the hacker yeah. mentality is a great persona to put on, to think like a hacker when you're stuck, to look for the unexpected direction. I've also seen the hacker persona work really well when you're stuck at the top level trying to get the contract signed. So one right. of the things in, in, in SaaS, because I work with a lot of SaaS startups, is the no contract contract. Basically, yeah. When you install it, turn it on, upload your data, the value is richer than the cancellation clause of a contract, so they don't want to turn it exactly. off. Right? So, so that's kind of hacked completely around the contract process, and that really created a disadvantage um, for some of my larger technology companies that go, we can't do that. Yeah. 
through the legal department. We always have to have a one-page terms and conditions to protect us, et cetera, et cetera. That is a you know, barrier to, to business. So that's the first persona, the hacker. Yes. The second persona is the chef. The chef becomes very important um, in the conceive level of the deal. So in the conceive yeah, level, that, man, you figure out your product mix, your services mix, your timing mix, your partnership mix, your integration component. When you bring in yeah. your smoking group, all of a lot that, of creativity. Yeah, you think like a you think like a chef, you'll create a great recipe, right? Um, so yeah. well, a chef's pretty agnostic to ingredients, right? That's really important in organizations that are focusing on the cross sale right now. So the chef mentality is great because you kind of you, you know that you get paid more on your steak, so you want to sell your steak, but you're also exactly. having to look at a variety of appetizers, salad options. Is it going to be soup, etc.? So you're going to put these ingredients together, put these timing elements together, create this menu. Focus on plating. If you think like a chef, you'll conceive a deal that is more likely to work quicker than if you think like yeah. a plating cook. Yeah, that's essentially the better deal 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 and also the larger deal. deal. Right? So yeah. that chef mentality is critical um, when you're trying to figure out a complex offering on your side that has to have high ROI or high cost of ownership. Um, sometimes you've got to be a chef in how you convince them too. So sometimes you're going to do what I call a mashup. I was working okay. with a class company that does a lot with a government agency. When they were trying to get the government agency to consider SAS, the agency's info security czar was like, I'm afraid of this. We can see premise here, right? So that was an issue. Yeah. But at the same time, the finance group at the government agency was like, we think premise is a waste of money. We're reading so much on cloud. All we use every day is things like Dropbox. So this selling solutions company came up with a mashup kind of thing where they basically positioned themselves as mass transit meets ADT. So in that particular instance, they use BART. They use ADT. Yeah. This cross metaphor that really helped the other company understand what managed cloud is really all about. They win the deal okay. Not just because of that, but because of that little device they were able to create that worked perfect for this agency where they knew about the attitudes and beliefs that were extant there. So that's a good, good example of being the chef. Here's the last one, the artist. Yeah. The artist shows you, they don't tell you. Sometimes you yeah. need to take on the artist persona, especially in the convinced level. And the reason why is either you're having a hard time differentiating from competitors, you're having a hard time creating urgency around change, or you're having a hard time communicating your value to people you're not in front of. You're going through this yeah. filter, right? Sometimes your spreadsheets are not enough. Sometimes yeah. Facts and figures meet with natural resistance, but the artist would look at that and say, well, I don't tell you about the woman, you know, that's posing in front of me. What do I do? I paint her. So, so the yeah. key for the artist is to reduce abstraction and to communicate intangible value. So that's going to help you think more visual. It's going to help you think more creative element in this process. And that's really when sales and marketing can really rock, but you got to take on the artist mentality, not the police. Yeah cop or vice principal mentality. So there's a zillion personas you could bring into a creative solution meeting on a deal, but the three we just talked about, the hacker, the chef, and the artist, those are their personas that lead to breakthroughs. Uh, absolutely, and, and you know, now, now we're sort of backing into the hard work that happens before the data storm, for all oh, yeah. of this to happen so really well. And I, and I know in the book you talk about the brief that you get for the meeting and how people gather outside the room X minutes before to get everybody in that mindset. Um, let's give them a sense of, in order to have an effective deal storm, what do you need to do before? Okay, that really, you've really dialed into what I think is the biggest takeaway in the entire book and the entire program, okay? Yeah. Chance favors the prepared mind. We saw the biggest jump in our effectiveness at Yahoo when I got a really good piece of advice from Tom Kelly at IDO Labs. Yes. Silicon Valley design consultancy. They're responsible for a lot of things like the Newton pump soap, et cetera. Anyway, Tom Kelly tells me that the secret to their brainstorming success was the design brief. It was very transparent. Yeah. The process of having to write it up solved the problem half the time. And then he tells me, quoting Louis Pasteur, chance favors prepared mind. And that's when I realized why brainstorming generally doesn't work. 
There's no incubation period. There's no thinking assignment that triggers people's minds to go to work. So here's what you do, very crystal clear. Yeah. Preparation is the third stage of the deal storm, okay? Mm -hmm. If you're gonna have a deal storm, I love to have them Tuesday at 10. Gathering time, 9.50, so we start on time. Tuesday at 10. If you're gonna have yeah. a Tuesday 10 deal storm, then Thursday by lunch, the week before, the deal brief must go out. What is the deal brief? It can't be more than four pages. I like it to be about three. Here are the elements of yeah. the deal brief. In the beginning, problem statement. Why are we stuck? What is the root cause? It's a healthy exercise yeah. for any AE, by the way. I mentioned before, sometimes just writing this deal brief helps you find an answer you haven't been seeing yet. So anyway, first thing is the problem statement. Second thing is the opportunity statement. What is the value? Why is this a big opportunity? Revenue or whatever. Yeah. You're in focus on a big why. Our reputation, winning in our market, gaining momentum in this vertical. The third yeah. section is the influence map on the other side of the table. Who are all the stakeholders? Who are the decision makers? Who are the bullies with the juice? Who are our champions? Yeah. Whenever possible, you link to LinkedIn. But remember, everybody on the team views anonymously so as not to creep out the prospect that eight to yeah. ten people have looked at their profile from the same company. But that's really important, the influence map. Underneath the influence map are activities to date with links back into Salesforce or whatever you use or yes. third-party sources if people, you're inviting people that aren't on your SFA. But anyway, be very transparent, be very honest. This is what we tried, this is what we said, this was their response, this is the status. Keep it at a high level, but help everyone that's joining the team understand what's happened so far so they can see things. Then, yeah. finally, if there's anything interesting that might help you think differently, like a SWAT, strength, weakness, opportunity, threat, a couple of articles that are current on that company might be helpful, you put them there too. Then at the yeah. deal brief, you write in capital letters, and there's a, there's a template for this you can download, your assignment. And this is where yeah. every deal brief is custom to every member of your team. So Ash, I might say, here's your assignment. I want you to really do some research and scrutinize my root cause statement, because it's the hardest yeah. part solving the problems, finding the real problem, okay? So I want you to, yeah. to help me understand why they're not returning our phone calls. I think I know why, but I want you to get to the bottom of that. Somebody else would be like, Larry, I want you to come into the meeting with at least one idea, but make sure you're clear on your assumptions. So anyway, if you give everyone a thinking assignment on the yeah. And you hassle them on Friday. Please read the brief. Let this roll around in your head over the weekend. Incubation sets in. And on Tuesday, you have a much more productive meeting because people have ideas, but more importantly, they have a sense of clarity about the exactly. behind their ideas. So we're not so defensive. We can be hard on ideas, but soft on people in that room. That yeah. brief will change everything when you're working against a big deal. So preparation becomes a critical step of the process. And writing the brief itself is something I get managers to make all their people do with anything above a five on size that stuck. Absolutely. If I am an account manager listening to you, Jan, talking about the briefing and this whole process, um, some account managers may actually sort of fear the fact that they may not have the skill set. Oh, well. Have you seen examples where they might pick somebody on the team who is even better at coordinating this whole process with the account manager still seen as the leader, oh, yeah. if you will. That's fantastic. So in a deal storm, there are four roles. Role number one is what I call the problem owner. That's the account executive. That's the person who's raised their hand and said, we have a problem. He runs the yeah. show. He makes the final decision in tandem with his or her manager. It's their show, right? The second role yeah. is the, and they're the facilitator too, by the way. Um, the second role is the information master. This is the person that is going to help them with the deal brief. They're going to be a scribe during the meetings. They're going to manage shared documents after the meetings to track project work. That's a very important role. That's what you're talking about here. Uh, by the yeah. way, the third role is the sponsor. Um, I like it just to be the manager one click up if possible, not the big cheese who's going to slow everything down and, and, and completely inhibit all the juniors from speaking the truth in the room. So yeah. that sponsor does not run the meeting, but the sponsor can contribute um, very sage advice during the meeting, talk about what could or couldn't be approved or worked, and then coach that AE later on how they ran the meeting, right? And then the fourth and final role is the resource. That's the person that's invited to come to the meeting and bring their brains. Anyway. 
The information master, there's a couple of places you can find that. You're looking for someone who can distill complex ideas into simple explanations. You're looking for someone who historically is a pretty good listener and knows how to create something with an audience in mind. Hmm. Smells yeah. like marketing. And it smells like mm -hmm. your marketing liaison, you typically work with a lot of case study development or collateral work. And by the way, they want to be part of your deals team. I, I, I am amazed at how quickly marketing responds to DealStorm team join requests and how much energy they bring to it. Or as one CMO told me, um, our belief is that if you're not at the table, you're probably on the menu, okay? So <laughs> if, marketing, if, it's not, if it's not marketing, it could be someone in sales enablement, like to use yeah. them, they like to be used in this situation, they love live ammunition, they love it. Um, sales training yeah. can also bring something to the table. So absolutely. If it's not your skill set, go get someone who can help you, but learn. Learn from the experience. I mean, I've written five books, Ash, and I had to have yeah. a writing partner on books one and two, and I learned. And yeah. I write my own books now, and I'm proud to do that because I'm more empowered That's than awesome. successful. That's the same thing with the deal brief. Don't be afraid to ask for help in the beginning, but learn every step of the way because in my experience, I have seen so many account executives rise to CRO or higher. Yeah. They got involved in deal storms, worked on the biggest, most difficult deals, paid attention, and became operators by understanding the rest of the business. Exactly. And they get seen as leaders. Mm -hmm. And I like how you, when you, you talk a lot about also making sure that when it's time for recognition, that people who participate in deal storms get some of that recognition. Because I think a lot of people will look at the account manager as the main beneficiary as far as commissions are concerned. But the company wins and everybody can win as well, right? Yep, so let's talk about that. So, so first of all, yes, I love recognition. Mark Schmitz at um, SAP Cloud, he's the COO there, told me that, and this started back at Ariba, who used that now. Um, yep. They give an award every year to a non-sales function who's participated in their collaborations, and that person goes to President's Club. Yeah. You want to change yeah. behavior? Open, open the circle a little bit for that. Career Builder has a Spirit of Excellence Award they typically give to engineers who help problem solve big sales challenges and transition. So what you reward is repeated. But let's talk a little bit about this idea of like, what do people get from being part of the deal storm? Dude, it depends yeah. on who you invite. When you're putting together a deal storm, you ask yourself two questions. One, who has a stake in the outcome? Two, yeah. who's an expert on my problem, okay? The stakeholders have a lot of value in being part of the process, right? Think about it. The yeah. account delivery team, the, the piece of finance that has to do revenue recognition, the piece of engineering that has to do the custom work or the delivery analysis, all of those cats have a huge stake in whether you win or lose, but more importantly, how you sold it in the first place. And when you invite exactly. them, it's a sales challenge and not a delivery crisis, it makes their life better. So they I think that is a big, that's a big one. That's yeah. definitely a big one. Because a lot of experts. people may end up saying something that engineering or services cannot deliver on because they weren't involved. Yep. And the account, account managers wanted to close the deal and that's not always good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so your stakeholders, they want to be involved. They want you to win. The win is good for them. That's why I asked who has a stake in it. But your experts, now that's who you have to convince. Because that expert Absolutely. could be another AE who sold to somebody that looks like this. It could be a mirror of the decision maker. So your CISO doing a mind mill about how to sell to their CISO. It could be a partner. It could be someone from a different part of the company you've never worked with before that knows exactly what the client's talking about on a spec deliverable. you got to convince those people. Okay. And Absolutely, yeah. is you don't invite them to come to a meeting that sounds like, like going to the dentist. You invite them yep. to join the team with a cause. That's why I talked about this bigger why than the money. You have to understand, what does it mean if we lose? Who wins if we lose? You've got to find a hot button that somebody exactly. else cares about to get everybody to go from me to we. So it's really important that you learn how to sell that through. Let me mention one more point. Um, yes. Sometimes, sometimes whiners are better than buddies when it comes to deal storming or solving anything oh. complex. Yeah. He, and I thought about this a lot. So here's the thing. There are these people in engineering that you work with and you know who they are. 
that yeah. whine a lot about what sales does to them. Throw yeah. a custom work over the wall that doesn't scale. Not setting yeah. up expectations. Over promising on everything from delivery elements to back end. You know those engineers. And every time you sit down yeah. with them, they're bitching about you, okay? I call those okay. the whiners. Yeah. Guess what? Almost every one of those whiners is only a whiner because they've got information you don't. They come in every day to bankruptcy, what they call technology bankruptcy. They're down 300 emails, and you don't see that. They've been yeah. saying over and over again, we can't do this, and somehow it hasn't gotten to you. 90% of the whiners are really the most experienced people that have the best information. That's why when they come to a deal storm, they blow you away. The other 10% of the whiners are lazy, but they're a very small percentage. And here's the good news. The lazy yeah. whiner will never come to your deal storm because they don't want to do any work. In so the first place, yeah. It's typically a whiner about what sales does to them. If you get that guy on your team, what he will bring yep. to you informationally is so much better than your lunchroom buddy you hang out with all the time who just tells you what you want to hear. So don't yep. worry about the whiners in engineering or finance or wherever. They are your best friends. And by the way, if you involve them in deal storms, you'll create relationships with them and they'll go from whiners to partners. Absolutely. And that's a, companies for that. that's a very nice point. And because I think a lot of people may think, again, you know, you're, it's like a one night deal where you, you're involving them now and then you're going to forget about them. How do you sustain the relationship? Because you know, as an account manager, you're going to come back to the same well. Of course. Um, uh, so, Back to the process here. I'm going to screen share this one more time. So I want to go back to this process here one more time to talk about the back end. Okay, we've kind sure. of and we're uh, half very soon. I, I appreciate your patience. That's fantastic content. So you execute, you analyze how you did. The most important thing you got to do, Ash, you got to report, 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 report. If you keep everybody in the loop on how the deal's going. When yeah. the deal's won, you report it all the way up to senior management and you give credit to the team, not individuals with ideas, but the people that did the work. You're going to keep them engaged. You're going to make other people want to join. And here's the last part of this. Um, the best time to build relationships is long before you need them. So when I kind of look back on my experience at Yahoo and I said, you know, what really helped me go from account executive to CSO in like three and a half years? Like what really made a difference? There was this decision yeah. I made the first day at Yahoo in the lunchroom. Um, the, for those of you on, on, on this, uh, that, that have worked at Yahoo, you knew that before our big corporate campus, we had two buildings in two different parts of, 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 of town. But I was in the Santa yeah. Clara, and I was at the, the lunchroom, the big old lunchroom in Santa Clara. So I walk in the first day, this is 2000 with my tray, and it looked like a yeah. movie Clueless. Everybody was uh -huh. clicks. Engineers were sitting together. Marketing researchers were sitting together. Sales were sitting together. Data analysts were all by themselves in a corner. It seemed so high school. And I remember telling my wife, well, I'm going to break this because it broadcast. We were a startup. Everybody ate with everybody because we depended on each other. Yeah. We didn't know if we were going to make it. You know what I mean? So I made exactly. it that day. Never eat with sales. So every day, I would set my table step out. at their table. Say, yep, hi, I'm Tim. Who are you guys? What are you guys up to? I'm with sales. They beat me up. I take it like Oprah. I'm cool with it. Okay, okay. Yeah. I'd ask them, what are you guys working on you're excited about? Most important networking question there is. What's your wow project? Yeah. They tell me. Yeah. I shut up. I let them talk. I listen. Exactly, yeah. Guess what yeah. they need to? Problems. It's all yeah, but. But. We're having yeah. a hard time getting budget for it. Yeah, but we got this big presentation to the CEO we're worried about. Yeah, but we can't get this partner. And all of a sudden, you're going to see how your sales skills can play in to help them. What do you say? I'll make your PowerPoint yeah. with you. Come, I'll coach you on that presentation. Wait a minute. You're trying to get a hold of Todd Teresi in finance? I know that, dude. Find a wow. way to do favors and do them early, okay? It's the favor economy at work. And you don't expect it. And I just made my investment over about four months. And about four months into this whole thing, we had a huge crisis on the Ford account. I mean, a big crisis on the Ford account. And this kind of came in the middle of 2000 where we couldn't have any bad news on a real company deal. I went back to several of those people and I didn't like say, you owe me. I went back and said, can you help me? And if they couldn't, they found out who could. That's what senior yeah. management was so impressed with is how did I build an eight person SWAT team in a company where people didn't talk to each other and get everybody to yeah. 
two hour meetings and agree to do work after the meeting. And that's when I said, you build long relationships before you need them. You focus on giving back and you always focus as a salesperson on lending your talents so that you always outgive everyone who helps you on your deal. And that becomes a Absolutely. Exactly, exactly. Tim, this has been fantastic. Well, we'll take a couple of questions to kind of wrap things up. The first one, maybe as a thought leader, as someone who's worked across these companies and consulted, what's your view how things are going in technology, the, the sales profession itself? How do you see it evolving? And then I'd love to hear from you how we can engage the audience uh, after we finish, where they can go and so on. Um, you know, I think that in technology sales specifically, I, I yeah. do think that there's going to be a lot of more automation at the first two stages of the funnel, you know, top of the funnel, um, automated demo. Um, I think all of that is uh, going to put more and more pressure on SDRs um, to prove their value over time. It's going to put more and more yeah. pressure inside sales uh, to make the huge leap to, to telepresence. I, I think that a lot of what we call inside of the video based, like what you and I are doing, where we can really make breakthroughs um, in interactions yeah. instead of just kind of pushing information at each other. So I think that's going to change. I don't think field's going to change. I, I think the kind of people that we hire is going to change. I, I do see that the top producer, Lone Wolf, is going to have a hard time finding a job. Um, so you see this in NFL football or even soccer, right? Where, like, you can see a yeah. superstar who's really good, but they don't work well with other people, and all of a sudden they kind of get stuck in their career. That's coming to sales. So I think that yeah. the sales leader, if I were to say one thing here, when you're interviewing a really good producer um, and you're thinking about bringing them into your sales culture and you're hearing what I'm talking about and saying, man, we've got to start working better as a team across the company, yeah. ask that candidate, tell me about the, the last job you were in um, about when you volunteered to help on a non-sales project. Talk to me about that situation. Why did you come yeah. off your job and do that? What was your mm -hmm. role? Was it worth your time? It's a trick question. Yeah. You know why? Yeah. Any answer is a good answer. It's like when you ask someone, what's the last book you read? You really don't care what they read. You care that Correct. they read. That was their lifelong learning urge, right? They're curious. So anyway, exactly. about that last project. If they say, well, it was a year and a half ago, they were doing this voice of the customer thing on a marketing, I met somebody at sales conference, she was passionate about the project, I got some value to add, my role was to bring in stuff out of Salesforce, and it was good. We produced a report that really helped everybody build a better product. That's a great answer. That's a person who knows how to do favors, build relationships, and I guarantee you they know how to play with non-sales people. On the other yeah. hand, if that candidate looks up at you and says, I didn't do it. I was heads yeah. down, man, killing my numbers. Yeah. Worry about that person. <laughs> Worry a lot about that person. In sales, we talk about horizontal turnover. That's where the rock star lone wolf stays and everyone else leaves, especially hey. account coordinators and delivery team. Those are the, you all know that your yeah. customer hates working with a new person. Okay, there is nothing That's more right. toxic to your renewals business than turnover at the account coordinator and delivery team level. And that's exactly what low wolves cause in an organization, especially with millennials who don't need this because yeah. they still they still live at home. I'm just kidding. That's an engineer. <laughs> that's, an engineer. That, that's, that's awesome. And thank you for that. I think that gives you a lot of insight in what to do in order to be successful because of time pressures on the deal they may just be, you know decide to be the person that doesn't involve others but you're basically saying involving others is your ticket to success that's and that's fantastic trick. the trick is i'm going to leave you with one idea i'm just going to show you one idea here because i just think you'll find this very very interesting and um i think this will be the final thought here for our, our piece here today so here you go screen share sure. this do with this i want you all to think about the power of four when you bring in a second perspective to a complex selling situation, you increase your chance of success by 25%. Think of that as sales wow. and marketing. When you bring in a third way of seeing the world, a third set of constraints or lack of constraints, you yeah. increase your chance of success by 100%. But when you bring that fourth one in, think sales plus marketing plus operations plus finance. For yeah. 300% spike. That's where the 3x comes from in close ratio. And then, of course, it drops off 
it turns into a go rodeo. You know, you bring five, six, seven, you can't manage it. You're like the buyer now. You're completely dysfunctional. Yeah. I just want to leave you with that is harness the power of four. Don't do it on your own. If you do it on your own, you're letting your kids exactly. kick your butt. If you're an enterprise leader, if you're doing it on your own, you're letting a startup kick your butt. And the reason why is because the startup naturally collaborates across disciplines because it's a race against death for them, especially in today's, you know, series A round crunch that's going on. So if you want Absolutely. to lead, swallow your pride, Learn this process, find a test case, and reinvent your culture. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you so much, Tim. Well, let, let's, uh, I really appreciate your sharing this. And let's Absolutely. give the audience a sense of how they can get a hold of the book, how they can engage with you, what destination would you like to send them to? So if you would like to get a free chapter of the book, you can go to dealstorming.net, dealstorming.net. You can get a free chapter of the book. The last thing I'll mention is um, if you buy a copy of the book, you'll receive access to my two-hour deal storming video-based boot camp. And it will really, really kickstart your ability to put this to work right away. So go to dealstorming.net. Tim, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for sharing this. And I will definitely be also posting this online for a lot more people to see. It's been a pleasure. Thank Wonderful. you so much. My pleasure too, Ash. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to the Top 1% Sellers Factory Podcast. Give us your suggestions and guest recommendations by emailing us at ash at connectwithash.com. Thank you also for sharing this podcast with your colleagues and social media contacts. To connect with us on LinkedIn, please send a connect request to ash at connectwithash.com. See you at our next episode. Thanks for tuning in.